Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. You're fine. All right. Hello, welcome. My name is Mary Lou Raboulis, Corporate Relations at CIM. On behalf of the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee, we thank you for attending today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am on the traditional and unceded territory of the Kanyan Hekaha Mohawk, a place which was long served as site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. Most of us attending today are also on traditional unceded territory. Today's session is on psychological safety and respectful behavior, the fifth and final session of a series focusing on the new TSM protocols. There will be a Q&A period at the end of the session, and you're welcome to type in your questions in the chat. With us, we have Teresa Naibizi, Technical Leader, Diversity and Inclusion at Valley Base Metals, Lynn McKinnon, Principal Advisor, Everyday Respect, Leadership and Behavior Change at Rio Tinto, Shauna Goldenberg, Director, Inclusion, Engagement at Eldorado Gold, and Dorina Quinn, Senior Vice President, People at I Am Gold. And now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Teresa, who will be moderating today's session. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. Uh, it is really my pleasure to be here today discussing a very important topic. As we round out the last in a series of five webinars, I just want to acknowledge that uh, this series of webinars has been brought to you by uh, collaboration and industry collaboration between CIM, Diversity Inclusion Advisory Committee, as well as MAC, Mining Association of Canada, as well as MIR. We saw that the TSM protocols were an opportunity for us as industry to really collaborate and to show each other uh, learnings so that we could all kind of accelerate our progress in, in adhering to the protocol requirements and of course, creating much healthier workplaces. Uh, today's talk is going to focus a lot on uh, the safe, safe, healthy and respectful workplaces performance. And the performance indicators that are part of that protocol are six of them. There's one around commitments and accountability, safety and health management systems, psychological safety and respectful behavior, training behavior and culture, monitoring and reporting, physical safety and health performance. Today, we are pleased to bring together uh, three professionals, Lynn, Shauna, and Dorina, who will introduce themselves as they go. And they're each going to present to you their perspective on a key component of the protocol, as well as commenting on the indicators, some of the best practices, and some of their challenges and positive experiences in implementing the protocols. Uh, this is a learning session. Please use the chat as much as possible. Put questions in the chat so that during the discussion, we can move the dialogue forward. So without much further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, who is Lynn, who is coming to us from Rio Tinto. Thank you. Hi, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Teresa. Um, so like Teresa mentioned, my name is Lynn McKinnon. I've been with Rio for about six years now um, in a number of different roles, started at our diamond mine in the Northwest Territories, um, supported IOC in Northern Quebec and Labrador. And at the moment, I'm in a role focused on leadership and behavior change as part of our everyday respect journey. Um, and that's really what I'll focus on today um, as it's really intertwined and embedded with our um, TSM standards and our implementations of those. Next slide, please. So really to get started, um, I wanted to walk you through our everyday respect journey. So this really um, was a key activity that we undertook. Um, I suppose we started about three years ago um, with the preparation. But essentially two years ago, we did a comprehensive review of our workplace culture. Um, we had it done independently. And really the intention was to better understand the type of harmful behaviors across our sites in the 35 countries, um, and also how best to prevent and respond to them. Um, we did that with um, EB and Co is the name of the organization um, run by Elizabeth Broderick, who's 
very um, well respected, particularly in Australia. She's um, one of the ambassadors for the UN's discrimination against women and girls. She was the former um, sex discrimination commissioner in Australia within the government. Um, so for us, one of the things that we wanted to do with this report that's quite different than you know, a typical people survey or a cultural diagnostic um, is that we wanted it done externally by experts. Um, and we did it quite broad scale. So we've got about 55,000 employees um, across the 35 countries. And we were able to get about 10,000 um, people to participate in a survey. Um, but we also did um, group listening sessions, individual listening sessions. There was the opportunity to submit written submissions. So as far as, um, you know, broadness and scale, it was a really significant diagnostic for us. Um, and not necessarily surprising, although very confronting to see, um, when we got these results back two years ago, um, the statistics that you'll see on this slide here were some of the findings. Um, again, very confronting, and it looked at the previous five-year window. So, you know, we had one in four women experiencing sexual harassment, uh, about 8% of men, about 50% of our population had experienced bullying, um, racism for about one in three, and then particularly significant with our Indigenous populations and underrepresented groups. Um, and 21 either reported or attempted um, sexual assaults at our workplaces and our camps. So um, in a nutshell, I would say very, you know, confronting results, pretty devastating. Um, but also I would say the thing that's most supported our journey and connected to these TSM standards is it's been really able to inform our actions. So uncovering this and really knowing what's going on as opposed to kind of the um, known unknown that we lived in before um, has been really helpful. Um, when I reflect on this journey as an organization, because we're two years in now, I would say something that really connects to the TSM indicator around leadership and safety that was most significant for us was that we released it publicly. So this is on the internet, it's available to shareholders, um, employees, anybody who wants to have a look. Um, and for us, that was really significant to A, release and make a public commitment to work on the 26 recommendations in the report. So Elizabeth Broderick not only assessed the culture, but also um, provided us that external expertise on you know, what could be the best actions to move it forward and to prevent some of this harm in the future. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of where we went from there, our framework for action fit into three broad categories. Um, and the things I'll talk about today are the ones most related to the TSM standards. Um, but I would say um, the most challenging part for us as an organization when we did this was to resist the temptation to jump right into action. So I know I've got a framework for action up on the slide here, but essentially um, one of the things that we did that was difficult um, for us was to really take the time to read and reflect um, and not jump right into action because one of the things that we have learned is that um, a muscle that is so strong in our company and, and often in the industry is that bias to action. You see a risk, you mitigate it. You see a problem, you solve it. Um, and there's almost a pride in, in reacting really quickly. And it is certainly not a bad thing in many cases. Um, but in this instance, if we were to have reacted really quickly, often your first response is um, to alleviate our discomfort with it. Um, it was a really difficult report to read. Um, so instead of jumping to action, we chose to sit with that discomfort, um, 
the leadership teams and the organization so that we could really reflect on what we've contributed, you know, to directly or as leaders, what we've allowed to happen around us. Um, and then we ended up with really different actions. So um, I don't want to use the word slow and steady, but I would say for us, um, resisting the temptation to jump into action right away without the reflection um, is something that has made our journey a lot more impactful than it might have been. Um, next slide, please. So there's, you know, of the 26 recommendations, there's a ton of initiatives um, that we are working on, but the ones I've highlighted here most closely connect to the work. Um, indicator three in terms of psych safety and respectful behavior, um, but also to some of the broader um, components within the EDI framework. So um, one of the things that we did is have um, everyone in the organization do a psych safety training that also really focused on upstanding. Um, and we know that training is not necessarily the answer to all things psych safety and respect, but that really was the, the quick action to get everybody um, aware of really important things quickly. Um, we've also launched a new code of conduct that has a very different tune um, than before. It's a lot more human centric. Um, a couple examples is that we've embedded, you know, diverse voices into our decision making models. Um, and it is a really a lot more focused on psychological safety with well-being, psychosocial hazards, belonging and those types of things, you know, under that umbrella. Um, we've also done a fair amount of work to embed this into our leadership programs. Um, some of that has been creating new programs. Others has been just relooking at anything we have that, you know, sets expectations for leaders, upskills leaders, equips them for their roles to really have a look at, um, is it up to date with the new culture we want to achieve? Um, and in particular, I would say on the leadership side, some things we've been focusing on right now that are challenging topics um, and, and difficult to explain and get leaders to engage in truthfully, um, but we've been doing a lot of work on power. So understanding your use of power, um, how it can be used to cause harm, not necessarily um, intentionally, um, and also how you can use your power as a leader to, um, to really have an impact in a lot of helpful and positive ways. Um, so again, it is a topic that we find, um, it, it's a bit of a dirty word that leaders don't love to hear power, but in any hierarchical organization, it is a big factor. And that's something that we're trying to really um, bring to help our leaders to that next level of how are they using their power as a leader um, to create safety and inclusion. Um, on the processes and measurement side connected to ESM, we've done a few things. So um, psych safety and psychosocial hazards are now part of our risk assessment frameworks, um, our maturity assessments, um, and that's across the board. And another thing on the you know, risk management side, but also it kind of where we see that bridge between the physical and the psych safety, is really looking at our facilities. So that was something that came out in the survey, um, really in terms of the physical environment can have a big impact on the well-being, belonging, inclusion, and safety. So in our first year post report, we did um, self-assessments that were co-created with diverse groups to really look at each site in terms of um, what might need to be fixed. Um, and that was, in some places, it was, you know, lighting in dark areas where people would walk alone on site. Um, it was even positioning of gym equipment, um, feminine hygiene products. There were a ton of different things, but a lot of them focused on um, what facility changes are needed for the psychological safety of our people and physical, of course. 
um, but it was looking really at the physical setting with the psychological lens is what was different about this work. Um, one of our biggest initiatives that you'll see here under Caring Response is we stood up a new, um, what we're calling Care Hub. So previously, and we still have, um, you know, a traditional whistle, whistle blowing hotline where incidents can be reported in whatever nature that they are, and there are formal investigations. But what we heard pretty loud and clear from this report is that folks didn't always trust those processes and that the ones that did go through them sometimes ended up re-traumatized or their feedback was that it was so focused on mitigating risk for the organization that they were in the dark, not very involved, and um, yeah, that they wouldn't do it again if they had the chance, which um, we know that if we're gonna address the harm, we need to hear about it when it happens and have a way to address it. So this care hub is actually a, a new mechanism um, completely built around trauma-informed investigations, but not just investigations. So essentially it's um, support for the whole person. There's well-being options. There's a lot of non-investigative options. Um, and we are seeing a, an increase in reporting from those, which for us, a uh, success measure is seeing an increase in reporting after everyday respect. Um, so for us, we've had about 270 people um, use our care hub in the last um, six months or the end, the six months that we're ending in 2023. So um, really good use. And also care hub is um, more broad than just supporting a person. So it's also a place where leaders, people can call and speak to an expert, whether it's um, um like a mental health expert or somebody who's, you know, really aware of these kind of things if they need help either supporting somebody or with the situation. So in some ways it's where leaders can get advice in the moment if they have something they are dealing with too. Um, and one of the really exciting parts that are is coming up right now, actually, um, starting in um, April, beginning of April is we are two years post the initial report. So um, this is connected to our measurement and external review components of the TSM, but we are having Elizabeth Broderick come back two years in um, to do the same methodology and to see what our progress will be. Um, and there's been a lot of actions um, as you can see, and this is only a small snapshot, but we are um, yeah, really curious to see how we're doing. Um, and I don't mean to be dismissive of ed &I in any capacity when I say this, but I would say it's um, so much of this work is experimental. So we try, we see if it works, we adjust. Um, so I think as a team and an organization, I know I speak for myself when I say, um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how we're doing um, because it's the kind of quantitative feedback you don't get any other way or through any other data sources. Um, next slide, please. And the last thing that I'll highlight in terms of um, recent initiatives is that we've stood up our employee resource groups. Um, we're calling them inclusive voices, but um, We've got them going now for gender, LGBTQ+, um, as well as neuroinclusion. And really this is um, a way for us to build in advise, advisory capacities from these underrepresented populations into our business decision-making um, policies, systems. Um, we're really excited to see where this could go. We've built it off of a lot of the best practice in the industry um, and are starting with, you know, these three groups with the intention of moving to, um, you know, broader ERGs in the coming years. And next slide, please. So, 
in conclusion, I know I've talked a lot about the initiatives that we've done. Um, when I reflect on our overall reflections from the journey, um, I would say some of our learnings was to avoid that bias to action, which we talked about before, um, and also to avoid um, focusing too much on data. It is a muscle, it's so comfortable for us, especially in these industries where it's just what we're used to. There's data on everything, we use it to inform decisions. But sometimes we did notice there's a tendency to want or focus on let's get more data before we this, or let's better understand before we this. So it's quite a balance of not rushing to action, but also not using, not having data, um, as a way to hold us back because in so many ways our people really did tell us um, what needs to change in this report. Um, and I would say another thing that we're continuing to work on is our focus on um, people and process. Um, sometimes the natural um, or the traditional way we've done things is more process over people. Um, so we are really trying to look at what is the felt experience of the person through her processes, not just which process delivers what and how. Um, and overall, I would say um, we have seen setbacks. Um, we do our best not to be disheartened. So some of our learnings is to not be discouraged and to keep going even when it feels hard. Um, and some of the things that we, um, I would say in, in conclusion, a lot of what we're working on is to create change for our people. Um, and I hope if any components of this um, are helpful to you on your journey, and I share it not because we're perfect, we've got tons of things to improve like you've seen, um, but we hope that um, this journey and progress can happen more broadly across the industry as well. Um, so if there's any, you know, questions or comments, we can do that at the end of the session. And otherwise, um, anyone is welcome to reach out if there's collaboration opportunities or questions. This is, you know, a topic where um, we like to share because it's a similar challenge that we're all trying to face and solve. It's quite complex. Um, so thank you. And with that, I'll hand it over to Shauna. Thanks, Lynn. I appreciate that. Um, much of what you said resonated, uh, especially the learning journey of the process uh, and some of um, the processes that you've implemented. So really enjoy that. Thank you so much. Uh, what I'll do is I'll share my screen. I apologize, everyone. Um, it might, I'm actually not able to share my screen. I, I'm getting a host has disabled participant sharing. Okay, um, let me let me try and get your presentation on. Just give me a moment, please. Sorry great, about that. Great. I guess what I could start with is introducing myself while um, the slides come up and, you know, starting with everyone to say good morning and good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're calling in from. Uh, my name is Shauna Goldenberg and I'm at uh, work at El Dorado Gold. Uh, I'm the Director of Inclusion and Engagement and I work in the HR department. Um, I have a global remit, and uh, what that means is I essentially work very closely with my HR colleagues and my facility colleagues at the facility level, at site level, uh, really to deliver on our commitments of safe and inclusive workplaces. And of course, the implementation and the alignment of both the new TSM protocols are very much a part of that. So today I'm going to focus on how employees can demonstrate their commitment to safe, healthy, and respectful workplaces as, um, as an overview to our processes at El Dorado. So when I first started about the content to put together, 
and thinking about this as a learning journey and um, people are joining this call very much from that learning perspective. One thing that occurred to me through my the work that I do is very much, um, where do you start? How do I start? What should I do? Where do I go? Um, and I often wondered, is there a right place to start? And I kept coming back to, I'm not sure that there necessarily is a right or wrong place to start. So I thought I would represent the conversation today in more of an ecosystem um, where there really isn't a starting point and it's not a linear process of policy program training process, but you really could have any access point in this concept of an ecosystem of building out um, the implementation of the protocol. As well, there were key words when I read the protocols over and over again, um, like policy, like training and measurement. So I thought today what I could do is use some examples of what we've done at Eldorado Gold and show it as more of that ecosystem of how the organization and employees can demonstrate their commitment to respectful workplaces based on the work that we've done from more of this ecosystem approach. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I thought I'd start by creating a snapshot of an inventory of where we are at El Dorado. So this is not meant to be exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination. It really is just meant to be an illustrative list of things that you can be considering and what you're using and what your focus areas are based on things like policies, processes, what programs you have in place, what are you using for measurement and what are you using from tra for training? So for example, when we're running surveys, you know, it's things like, are we using consistent themes or consistent topics that get surveyed over time, over years, so that it supports a trend analysis to see how, you know, are we improving, are our topics going this way, are topics going this, the wrong direction, especially when it comes to respectful workplaces. And of course, that feeds action planning. Uh, and again, that holistic approach of uh, consistent uh, growth and con uh, continuous improvement. When we created our respectful workplace policy, we considered some of the other policies um, that we have in our organization. And we considered them because we wanna see, do they reference uh, respectful workplaces? Are they similar? So when we're creating this respectful workplace policy, what other impacts are we making uh, from different policies, creating consistency organizationally or creating confusion organizationally? So that's why, again, like this, this concept of putting an inventory together was very much about seeing how are we uh, impacting the organization with, with the work that we're creating? Um, and again, I think it's worth, you know, that rinse and repeat process or, or thought process for the other aspects that um, of the protocols like processes and programs and so forth. Um, if you wouldn't mind advancing to the next slide. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, so the next thing that I also considered a lot when, um, oh, sorry, we're ahead, but I'm jumping back. Yeah, thanks. Um, one of the things that I considered a lot when we started this was, of course, how do we implement this at the facility level? How do we make, um, how do we engage our facility leaders, our employees at the, at the facility with this work? So I start often with a what you know what's in it for the facility at the at that level, and obviously there's different drivers for different organizations depending on how you're structured, where you're located in the world, are you a public company, are you not? Um, these are the types of things uh, that that we consider uh, at El Dorado. So things like you know we know the external landscape has changed, for example, and you know, over the past decade or so, very much focused on the E and the G. And now we're seeing a lot of dominance moving towards the S. So, you know, and it's and it's really about building that inclusive and respectful workplaces. 
we see that also, you know, for major projects and from financing and lenders, they're asking questions of, about the S of the ESG nowadays. So that's that's a strong driver as to why uh, do this at the facility at the facility level if there's projects that are going on. Um, from the internal drivers perspective, you know, we all know that depending on where you are in the world, it's a competitive landscape for talent right now. And again, like with that shifting culture from, you know, not just the E and the G, but that S part, prospective employees are starting to ask as part of the interview process, what does respectful workplace look like at your organization? What, and they, you know, go on your website to see, do you have policies process posted? Are they asking about processes internally? They may even ask questions about what type of training, leadership training and competency development is available to ensure that the workplace is respectful. So this could really be a diff differentiator for organizations to build your, your, uh, your brand and help with the recruitment and the attraction aspect. So that was a consideration for uh, the purpose as well. So starting next off, what I did is I, you know, starting with our global respectful workplace policy and, and thinking from that perspective, um, you know, in that ecosystem, starting at policy, um, really we redesigned our global respectful workplace policy and Really, if you don't mind moving in to the next one, what I thought it could do is provide some key considerations when designing policy, uh, especially around this. So things like, um, you know, are we are we um, supporting what's already written in other policies like our code of ethics and business conduct? Um, you know, for individuals, um, are we stating adherence to the policy? Expectations to raise concerns and like. For leaders, stating a heightened responsibility to uh, protect the workforce and escalate concerns, as well as the company's um, responsibilities to investigate where warranted, to protect employees against retaliation, and where possible, keeping reports and concerns confidential. Moving on to building out a program uh, that supports a respectful workplace policy. Um, that's next in the idea of the ecosystem. Um, we put together a global framework uh, for respectful workplace policy. Apparently, if you don't mind advancing one more. Thanks. Um, so if like me, you might be a corporate resource partnering uh, with uh, facility level colleagues, whether in HR or other departments, when building out programs, it's having that framework for the program and the design in place can prove useful for how do we create something that's global in scope, but the actual implementation has to be locally specific, as you know, depending upon local laws, local traditions, local customs, what works in one country or one location, even within the same country, may not work somewhere else. So it's that uh, harmonious participation um, and collaboration in order to uh, work out the design and also uh, flexibility with the timeline. So, you know, we considered it uh, the rollout of in phases. So one location may be ahead of a different location or perhaps there's something happening at a different location where they don't have the bandwidth at the time to implement and maybe they need it at a different phased approach. So put some of that together for consideration um, as a framework when rolling out policy and program. Next up, we also uh, took a look at behaviors. Merely if you could advance the slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we took a look at the, um, the spectrum of behaviors for disrespect and mapping out examples of behaviors that define what disrespect looks like covers a range of behaviors and on an, an a very broad continuum increasing in severity so these examples are helpful because you know if you post this into your internal website and post this in different areas of your business especially for in places that don't have access to email or desktops at a regular interval this type of thing is helpful because they can then 
um, use this, employees can use this as a reference point for consideration on next steps to take. And then of course that leads to some processes. So once we have our policy in place and our framework in place about our program and our behaviors mapped out, next up we'll take a look at some of the processes that we considered. So um, these are some of the best, the best practices that we considered when uh, implementing uh, a global respectful workplace policy, including worker voice mechanisms and investigation um, techniques. So aligning with that continuum of behaviors, we gathered these best practices uh, to consider how to design uh, and implement these uh, worker voice mechanisms. So, you know, especially that it gives multiple uh, entry points for workers to report, uh, including confidential or um, formal and informal named anonymous. Um, all of that can be considered for different levels of reporting requirements and different types of reporting requirements. From the investigations perspective as well, um, having consistency mapped out as to what the steps are uh, in terms of actioning investigations is helpful for employees to understand and it gives them confidence uh, to report. And the one thing that I would say is, um, you know, for the investigation piece, of course, uh, I, I we believe that it is a best practice to ensure that the people who are uh, responsible for the investigations have training, uh, time, time over time, um, you know, sometimes perhaps in year one, you might have a lot of uh, investigations. In year three, you may not. And investigations is a muscle. Um, so constantly flexing that muscle and getting the practice is helpful and having repeated training on it to ensure consistency and alignment and also helps to remove bias from the process is important uh, as, a, as a best practice. Uh, moving on to the worker voice mechanism, again, it's having those multiple channels for employees to voice concerns. And this helps to foster inclusive culture because employees feel welcome to voice these concerns. A variety of informal or formal channels, um, sh this should be communicated to employees, whether it's in induction and onboarding training, or it could be as well through annual training. Um, but again, the intent of this is to build confidence amongst the employee population that it's okay to report. And I would caution that um, as these tools and processes are being created organizationally, it's very likely to expect increased reporting coming through the processes. Um, so, we also considered how to triage reports when they do come in. So we put together a flow chart or a triage process. Um, if you don't mind uh, advancing to the next, thanks, Marilyn, um, on how to handle concerns. And again, we think this is a great thing to also uh, communicate internally because when employees understand uh, what the process is, what they're signing up for, if they make a report, it also encourages them to report more often and it gives them um, assurance that something will be done and what they can expect. So it, it eliminates the uncertainty for them. Um, so we put that together and we we um, we post this as well on our inter internal our internal site. So moving along um, from policy program, some processes that support all of that, you know, we've got all of these things in place. So now what do we do? So how would we take a look at some measurement internally? And in 2023, we, um, we kicked off a new survey, um, a health and safety perception survey. And safety climate, falls under the category of a leading indicator because it provides a sense of the company's performance 
and the potential for injuries, both physical and psychological, before they occur. Uh, so I thought I would talk a little bit about that in terms of designing the survey and how we can use it to measure. So when designing culture uh, perceptions surveys, multi multiple dimensions can impact a worker's perception. Um, and by categorizing these factors, it helps to determine where to focus your action and planning for when the results come in and the assessments of the surveys. So things like consider breaking questions out and then avoiding asking, avoid asking and or type questions. Um, this may help have, um, you know, organizations may have strong physical safety scores, but this concept of psychological safety is somewhat new. So breaking those, uh, those concepts apart, rather than keeping them together in the structure can help uh, with the results and identifying where to focus your attention in the future. So we broke this out into approximate. So yeah, go ahead, Mary Lou, to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, we measured. We broke this out into seven factors and asked about thirty plus questions. Um, these factors measure a degree, the degree to which employees feel that they have the tools, they understand the processes, the policies, they see leadership acting. Uh, in step with policies and processes in a consistent way. They have access to PPE, to information, to communication in a timely and effective way, and that they are equipped to work in a healthy, safe, and respectful manner. So that's what all of this was meant to measure. What I'd like to call out here is uh, notably uh, on that previous slide, sorry, <laughs> uh, on the previous slide is um, the questions that we asked, uh, I've highlighted them in green that uh, are related to respectful workplace. And as you can see, we've peppered them in throughout multiple factors, um, like company practices or enablement, asking questions like, I know how to report unethical behavior or practices. I know where to raise concerns in relation to my own or my colleagues' well being. And the next slide. Um, it also uh, continues into those factors that I was talking about and the types of questions. And this one in particular, it's noteworthy to call out the supervisor section. So what I was talking about before, about um, creating questions that are not and or focused, but actually you break them out into two specific questions. So in that supervisor section, we've got the question, my supervisor genuinely cares about my psychological safety and well-being. And the question above it is about, is the same question, it just asked for my physical um, health and safety. So we broke that out specifically. And again, what you can do is cross pollinate those with other demographics of the organization to ensure that, you know, the psychological safety is being felt. Is it different or is it not different than physical health and safety? And are different demographics of the organization experiencing this in the same way? So that it's that intersectionality piece that you can layer in. And then last but not least, uh, I wanted to call out directly related to respectful workplace, uh, again, is uh, what we put a factor in of called voice. So the employee's voice, can they voice up? Do they have the tools on the skills and the PPE to work safely? But do they also possess the skills to speak up without that fear of judgment or retribution? So th those questions there really uh, are aimed at tackling uh, that underlying theme. And then lastly, to wrap up, um, what we do with our surveys, essentially for our, um, our global listening strategy, we have a listen, focus, act model. And that listen that listen piece is really about the surveying. So it's asking employee, employees for feedback because feedback is that le leading indicator of your culture. The focus piece is really about distilling that feedback and identifying key areas of opportunity. And then the act piece is, uh, you know, looking for the demonstration of leadership commitment to building uh, impactful action plans 
to you know continue to shape the culture of the organization uh, in that safe, healthy, and respectful way. And then I've just included the technology that we use uh, organizationally, and it's called uh, it's called Ultra. And then moving on to um, the training piece, uh, you know, oftentimes as a result of a survey, um, some of the actions that could come out of it is training. So as an example, um, what you could look at here is based on uh, the two questions from the voice factor, uh, psychological safety between leaders and employees is a really a two-way street and it needs to be co-created um, to form that speak up culture. So employees can speak up, but leaders also need to be, to demonstrate interest in the employee voice and curiosity around that employee voice. And then it creates that uh, momentum for speaking up. And designing training on how to create that environment where it's okay to speak up. So we put some design considerations there as well you know, tying it into your leadership development program, creating leader guides. I think, you know, creating training programs, um, pretty straightforward, but wanted to share share some of that with you as well. And, you know, moving to close, I just wanted to say, you know, similarly to what Lynn shared, um, very much about this has been a learning journey for us. Um, and growth mindset and continuous improvement as throughout the process. So thank you. Um, and then over to Darina. Mm, hi everyone, um, just double check. Thank you very much, Shauna, that was amazing. Um, same with Lynn, I, I just wanna pause for a moment to ensure that Darina is able to join us. Uh, we might actually move into Q and A a little sooner uh, due to some technical issues uh, on during uh, from Dorina. Um, yeah, so quick check in, Mary Lou, is uh, Dorina on, or can we go ahead with our Q and A? Sorry, yeah. um, I don't see her. Okay, so let's go to the Q and A. Okay, so let's get Lynn back on camera and Shauna. So. Thank you so much. Um, I absolutely, what a treat. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm not trying to say we saved the best for last in this webinar series. However, I can say that uh, the content has been so, um, you know, it's very tactile, right? This is getting to the, the root of the issue, which is ensuring that individuals are able to have positive work experiences. And we all know that none of it happens automatically, right? You can't do it in autopilot. It has to be intentional. And that's what I, you know, some of what we've seen demonstrated today. So as I was, uh, as you were both presenting, I was making some notes. So it really, in no particular order, I really wanted to lean into this idea of, uh, and I love how you named it, Shana, the, the, the employee voice. That is so important, right? To hear things from the perspective of the individuals you want to help. You know, this idea of you want to help me thrive, but don't assume what I need to thrive. You want to hear from their voice. So it brings me to the question around surveys. Surveys are extremely important tools, but language can vary in demographics in a company, right? From the frontline workers, even to the executives, how we see or receive communication can be quite different. Did you, were you, did you, do you tailor your surveys so that different audiences receive the same content in different ways? Um, yes, yeah, so a couple of things. Um, I think it was, I can tie that back to that um, framework slide that I had shared, which is really about partnering with uh, local colleagues to ensure yeah. the design is suitable, especially in translation, that it's available mm -hmm. in local languages. Where we, we need to rephrase and communicate differently, um, how that can be done. So that's definitely a part of the process on the design side that happens uh, well up front. And on our design, on our um, our question design, it takes about eight weeks um, to front load the yeah. process in terms of landing that, um, having a few iterations, working with local colleagues, making sure that um, even things like gender, some languages don't have gender, some languages right. are gendered language. Um, 
So even that in, in and of itself gets uh, caught up in translation. Yeah, for sure, and, the nuances of language. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then in terms of um, those factors, uh, so things like leadership versus supervisor, uh, we also def um, provide definition as to what this means to the person reading it. So it's almost like it's the same survey, but it's designed in such a way that people get more explainers as, as they require. Uh, is it required? You know what's interesting too when you think about the idea of uh, getting employer voices, especially when it comes to psychological safety and whatnot. Something that was coming to my mind was getting people to do surveys. I know I'm horrible when I go to stores and they just like, hey, we just want your input so we can serve you better. <laughs> and even me knowing that that's the intention, it can be hard to like uh, cross the boundary of actually doing a survey and contributing my voice. Uh, in the workplace, uh, really curious for both of you, uh, Lynn and Shauna, how do you handle that, uh, The making sure people are aware of how important their participation is? Yeah, I can jump in for that one. Um, it's a really good question because I would say um, we're probably not unique in having the challenge that there um, is a tendency to survey populations. Um, so I would say generally our audience is over surveyed. Um, so in particular, when we were looking at the everyday respect report, um, we emphasized a lot of the other opportunities to participate. Um, and we found a lot of value in say like the listening sessions or the written submissions, because there's a lot of meat that folks um, want to express and are more willing to express than when you have to click, um, you know, select one of the drop down options. So yeah. I found it's, of course, a more complicated way to do that. But yeah. I, my reflection would be we got a lot of meaningful feedback we wouldn't have gotten. Um, so I would say um, really getting into the heart of the why we were doing everyday respect is probably the angle that we took to encourage the participation um, and also giving so many different options uh, and the option to, you know, say, tell your story, not mm -hmm. just fit your story into the box. Um, so that was really our approach with everyday respect last time. Um, and this time around, there's been enough you know, momentum um, that folks are quite familiar and we're hoping for similar, you know, high levels of participation. Yeah, absolutely. And especially seeing action coming out of your, your feedback is probably something that can be very motivating to people. Uh, there's a question in the chat here, which talks about how do you mitigate social des desirability in data collection and also the safety privacy of the interaction between employee leaders and employee voices. Sorry, could you read it again? So really around uh, uh, how do you mitigate the social des desirability in data collection and also the safety privacy in the interaction between leaders and employee voices? So I think it's really speaking to the fact that we really want to encourage people to speak up and but what, what is the, how do we maintain that safety and privacy in that feedback that we're being graciously offered? Um, our surveys that we've run so far um, are confidential and anonymous. So mm -hmm. at, no, uh, at no time throughout the process from start to finish um, and at results analyzing, are we able to tell specifically where this came from? And we have a reporting threshold. Um, at, at least five responses or more have to come in from a certain area. Uh, otherwise, we don't see results. Okay, so they definitely kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, aggregated in a way that, but you, of course, you can tell what area, what work area people came from. Not, and all, not all the time, but sometimes okay. we, can, we can get general sense like, uh, you know, it could be our corporate office that we will know. Uh, yep. But we won't know who within, and we also won't have any idea of, um, it's it's a double built in where you can't even uh, re-engineer it backwards to figure it out. Right on. Uh, there's a question in the chat, which is related to the survey Q&A. Did you allow for paid time off from regular duties in order to participate in surveys or focus groups? 
But how did you manage that? And probably you're thinking more along the lines of shift people who work shift, right? Uh, because of obviously these implications on you know somebody taking time away to yeah. I mean, Lynn, you yeah. might want to jump on this one. Uh, the surveys that we we conduct uh, take under ten minutes to respond to. Uh -huh. but even so they are compensated uh, with, within the work hours and after for that time. But go ahead, Lynn. Yeah, and on our side, I would say um, very similar. Um, so if it did require additional time, because sometimes those listening sessions, and especially a shift work schedule, um, required some flex from everybody. Um, yeah, we certainly made sure that it was considered part of their, um, you know, regular accountabilities at Rio Tinto. Um, and to touch on the, the survey question from a bit earlier, um, mm -hmm. one of the things that we like about using external firms is there's so many layers of removing anything identifying, and you can have so many more validations of that. So we like to know before it even gets to anybody's desks at Rio Tinto that there's been a number of passes to just make sure that anything that could identify folks is removed. Um, but one of the challenges that we are having, and it connects to the TSM protocols in the sense of the transparency component, is we want to start being more transparent about the action we're taking to address harmful behavior, and we still have all of the privacy um, components that we need to protect um, and safeguard the individuals who experience the harm. Yeah. Um, so I would say with that one, we actually don't, we're trying to be bolder in what we share, but won't sacrifice, um, you know, confidentiality or privacy. So that's something we're trying to navigate, um, but don't quite, you know, have a magic formula for yet. Yeah, so maybe, it's, so basically it's saying that, you know, we've asked for all this transparency, but how do we know that the people who have shared will be okay afterwards? Yeah, and also we would like it to be clear that we are taking action when harm happens. Um, mm -hmm. But it's hard to, you know, we need to balance both of those things. For sure, for sure. Another question I want, uh, that we wanted to kind of bring up here was, um, there's uh, a question around, so you've, you know, and thinking of you, Lynn, especially, you you know you talk about the everyday report and when it was done and the people who were surveyed and the awareness you raised in the organization around that, but you haven't stopped hiring. You've got all these new people you're onboarding into the business. How do you bring them along so that they're catching up to the they're catching up to that awareness piece that you've worked so hard over the years to uh, to infuse into the organization? Yeah, really good question, um, because I think anyone who was in the organization when it happened, you know, can't forget it. Um, but one of the things that we've integrated into our onboarding for everybody is mm -hmm. the um, psychological safety and that upstander training. So if you worked here when we rolled it out, you completed it. And if you haven't, you take part when you join. And as part of that, we have a component that tells the everyday respect story um, so that folks that, you know, weren't here at least know the context and the important parts about what we're expecting from them and what we're trying to achieve. Right. Perfect. Uh, someone in the chat gave us a question. They said, how can individual accountability be enhanced based on your on our that cut the company that's talking here based on our past work? A common pattern we've noticed is the illusionary superiority by bias, wherein individuals tend to rate themselves higher than others and expect others to perform better than themselves. This bias contributes to the challenge of increasing accountability. We believe that improving accountability is shared responsibility with 50% influenced by the organizational conditions and 50%, um, the remaining 50% by individual self-awareness and, and accountability. Um, so uh, I don't know who wants to take that one, this like, accountability piece. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm uh, interpreting it correctly, but I'm, if I'm, if I am, um, it may be helpful to consider um, 360 uh, interview process where individuals, especially um, at a senior contributor level, 
uh, are getting feedback from up across and down within the organization. And yeah. that feedback can be um, put together into a report that, um, you know, oftentimes strong performers in their boss's eyes are seen um, and rated very highly, but people across and down within the organization aren't experiencing it the same way, which of course, when then a report comes in about a, maybe incivility or disrespect of some sort, um, it comes as a bit of a shock and a surprise. So oftentimes yeah. a 360 uh, feedback may help uh, uncover mm -hmm. some of those stones. Yeah, and um, thank you. Those are some really good comments, Shauna. On our side, I would say it's something that has been top of mind for us. Um, and in the leadership development capacity, um, one of the key things that we built in in the post everyday respect world is um, understanding yourself as the key foundation before you can be an inclusive leader. So um, for example, we did a very specific program with our general managers that focused literally on understanding themselves. Um, and we've incorporated that at different layers too, but really with the intent that if we don't understand our own traps and tendencies and biases, and we all have mm -hmm. them, um, then it's, you know, you don't unlock the keys to be an inclusive leader if you, you know, can't see those things about yourself. So I would say kind of the key way that we're tackling that is starting with that, you know, self-awareness foundation um, in our yeah, and program. If, yeah, and, you know, if I circle back to this idea of the TSM and these very transparent rankings, how have you uh, socialized that TSM and its importance to all levels of the organization, just so people can kind of see the journey of where you, where you are and where you're going? Have you taken any tactics to specifically make sure that the knowledge of that protocol was amplified in the organization? Sorry, do you want to tackle that one or do you want me? I've got some Doesn't ideas. Matter. Sure. Yeah, you go ahead, Shauna. Okay. Um, so we have a sustainability management framework, which um, has the TSM protocols embedded within it. And we, you know, as the protocols have changed and matured over time, so has our sustainability management framework. So it does have iterations over the years. Um, and then, of course, a part of that is, you know, building that into the overall strategy of the organization, building that into uh, scorecards for leadership, for site, for management. And then that, of course, uh, trickles down into goal setting and uh, individual performance. All right, on. So the, the awareness piece is because it actually hits people at a very individual level. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, very powerful. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what I want to do right now is uh, we're going to be uh, closing soon, um, but I wanted to just give a last call to the people on the chat, see if you have anything that you, you want to ask. But I think what what I what I do want to, um, before we, we close, I wanted to just maybe recognize that I really appreciate the, the, the I think the mining industry should really be very proud. I mean, the level at which we're trying to listen to, to the employee base to find out how their experience in work is so powerful. And a lot of that is in how you actually communicate with people. Uh, many of us on the call today are on our computers. We're able to, to you know, log, in, log on and interact. Uh, many of our frontline workers don't have that luxury. They work shift work uh, and they're you know, often underground or in the pit and they can't really stop to participate in a webinar or, you know, uh, I just wanted to maybe close off understanding that challenge and how you've kind of met that challenge head on of communicating with people who aren't on laptops every day. And maybe I'll start with you, Shauna, on you, you did mention some physical boxes and I just was curious how that how that went down and the uptake in using physical communication. Um, well, I guess I can start with Tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., I'm hosting a facilitated conversation, a 20-minute meeting on our surveys um, with our employee population, our frontline workers, um, before shift uh, and after shift. Uh, and I'm actually in Greece. 
Um, I've partnered with a health and safety team member here in Greece who is a Greek national, speaks Greek, um, and together we've designed the facilitated session. And um, we will be presenting to them uh, in person uh, in their language. Um, while I'll be the subject ex matter expert on ter in terms of survey design, so should question comes in, I can um, speak in English to health and safety and health and safety will translate to the worker population. So that's, we're fortunate enough to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and again, like it's that partnership at the local level and building those relationships with, you know, not just the HR department, but other departments so that we can really get to the frontline workforce, the people that get the metals out of the ground um, is one way. And then another way that we, um, we've got a few different types of communication tools available. Mm -hmm. You know, digital signage, for example, where production yep. production numbers are, you know, running through sites. So people have a visual target to understand what what they're accomplishing on a day to day basis. If that's right. helpful. No, very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say um, on our side, I think one of the components is allowing time and not underestimating the complexity of that. Um, for the non-networked populations, like it's not as easy right. as putting it on an email and a TV. Um, if you have a two and two population, you need three weeks for a message to even reach anybody, best case scenario. So for us, I would say in global programs, it's always trying to make sure we understand the needs of the sites and to give the time for it to be done well. That's a very good point because, you know, oftentimes when people talk about surveys, they they say, oh, you know, you want to go in and out. You don't want to belabor the, yeah. the experience. But I mean, with shift workers, I mean, we think of even ourselves, how many times do you need to hear a message to actually buy in? Like even yourself, Shauna, when you're in Greece, when you do your face to face, it might still be another two weeks before people say, OK, I understand what she was getting at, I'm now going to fill out the survey. So you're right. No, that's a very good call out, Lynn, as people do their project uh, planning, give it the time that it needs because, you know, culture is not something you just shift overnight. Yeah, meet people where they're at. Yeah, meet people where they're at. And I do want to close off with this last question from the chat, which is, uh, and maybe it's a philosophical one for us on the call today, is uh, she? the question is, is there a future where inclusion, respect, and safety can be 100% a reality. What do you believe, predict would need to happen? Uh, so I don't know who wants to, Lynn, maybe you wanna go first and then we'll close off with Sean. Yeah, I would say um, 100%, I would say it's always going to be a journey, um, but I do believe that we can get to a place where say our grandchildren um, live in a very different reality than we have right now. Um, but would we ever fully get there? I don't think so, because I think there will be always things that can be changing and to be done. Um, but I do believe that even though we have all of these, you know, challenges and the harm that we've seen in our industry, um, leaders don't, you know, wake up in the morning wanting to harm. So I think mm. it's, it's so much, mm. much about getting into that space of not necessarily what we intended, but what were the impacts and felt experiences. So it's a journey. Um, and I think it's a kind of personal growth journey for folks as much as it is, you know, professional. So it takes time, but I, I definitely think we can, you know, achieve a very different culture um, with the right commitment and the right work and desire from everybody. Thank you very much, Lynn. Thank you so much. And Shana? I actually don't think I can add to that because yeah. I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. No, it's very powerful. Um, yeah. You know what I will say for us on the call today? It reminds me of a, a quote that I saw, and I won't say it right, but it really was around is oftentimes the planter of the seed might not get to enjoy the fruit of that cultivation. It reminds me of people like Martin Luther King, who came before us, who might be absolutely shocked at the level of societal integration that's happened. Nelson Mandela, like all of these powerful people who were planting and planting and planting. So I think my take to your question, Christina, is around um, 
we may not be there to see the full realization of the, of what we're planting, but I certainly believe that we're going to get there and we will have a future where inclusion, respect, and safety are 100% a reality, and uh, we look back fondly at the pioneers who planted the seeds. So, with that, I just want to wish everybody a beautiful two. Oh, is it Tuesday, or Wednesday, people? <laughs> it's Wednesday. I want to wish you all a beautiful Wednesday. Stay safe, and this is great work. And thank you so much for caring about this topic. Um, I feel like I'm in with kindred folk here, and it's uh, such a special moment. And I wish you very well. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care.